Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar titled Research in Child and Human Development, Some Important Lessons for Policy and Practice. This webinar is organized by CRCD, the Center for Research in Child Development at the National Institute of Education, Singapore. Through this webinar, we hope to bring together policymakers, academics, and practitioners to engage in discussions pertaining to research in child and human development. We are looking forward to having a fruitful and an engaging session today. During the webinar, any questions from the audience will be addressed during the panel discussion at the end, which will allow for a Q&A segment. Any questions you may have can be typed into a Slido Q&A page, which will be shared later on for you to access. Do note that, however, not all questions may be brought up to the panelists due to time constraints. If you are facing any technical problems during the webinar, please write in to nie.crcd at nie.edu.sg and you will be assisted shortly. Today, we are very lucky to have with us three very distinguished guests and experts in the field of child and human development to share some of their valuable wisdom, insights, and research experiences with us. Professor Richie Poulton, who is Director of the Dunedin Multidisciplinary Health and Research Unit in New Zealand, Professor Catherine McBride, who is Professor at the Department of Psychology in the Chinese University of Hong Kong, and Professor Marinus Van Eijendorn, who is Professor of Human Development at the Erasmus School of Social and Behavioral Sciences, Department of Ed Psychology, Education and Child Studies at Erasmus University Rotterdam in Netherlands. Aside from the three main speakers, we also have with us CRCD Center Director, Professor Tan Eun Singh, who will be delivering the opening and closing addresses, as well as CRCD co-director, Associate Professor Kenneth Poon, who will be moderating the panel discussion and Q&A segment, which will be held towards the end of the session. So for today's program, uh, we will start by having Center Director Prof Tan give his opening address. Afterwards, Professor Richie Poulton will speak on his topic on the pernicious effects of low childhood self-control and how they reach well into midlife. Next, Professor Catherine McBride will talk about the impact and applications of research through developmental psychology, sharing on some of the projects she headed on literacy learning. Our last speaker, Prof. Marinus Van Eijendorn, will discuss some debated issues related to the replication crisis, such as what can be done to enhance replicability in research and its relevance to translation to policy and practice. We will then have a panel discussion and Q&A segment involving all three speakers, which will be moderated by Associate Prof. Kenneth Poon. Lastly, Prof. Tan will give a closing address. So without further ado, I will allow Prof. Tan to give his opening address. So may I invite Prof. Tan, please? Thank you, Jalyn. Very good afternoon to everyone. On behalf of the Center for Research in Child Development, I'm pleased to welcome you to our webinar entitled Research in Child and Human Development, Some Important Lessons for Policy and Practice. We are delighted to have you with us today to participate and share in our discussions about children's development and learning. You know, there are many reasons why we should be excited about research in child development. First and foremost is the increased attention and investment in the early childhood sector. There are already ample evidences on why early childhood. However, we also need to know how best to do early childhood in the various contexts. How can we improve and design interventions with quality? Secondly, there has been increasing interest in the science of human development. Advances in genetics, genomics, and autonomics and neuroscience, as well as psychological sciences, have brought about new insights about enhancing human lives and well-being. In particular, having interventions to start as early as possible. Thirdly, the value of cross-disciplinary and interdisciplinary collaboration, such as among education, healthcare, the science of learning, and artificial intelligence calls for research to keep up and to tap on new opportunities. 
Fourthly, I would say that we now recognize more and more the multiple perspectives needed to solve problems. So in the early childhood sector, for example, we need to understand the economics of early childhood, the equity issues, the essence of early childhood itself, the education of early childhood, the educators of early childhood, and the whole ecology of early childhood. And fifthly, following COVID and the uh, development of vaccines worldwide, we are ushered into a new era of looking at research data in very different ways. Big data, longitudinal data can give us fresh insights and impactful ways, particularly when we think of how to translate research into interventions, programs, policies, and practices. So the Center for Research in Child Development, CRCD, was established in 2017 as a research center funded by the Ministry of Education Singapore with the aim to better understand the science of child development in the context of Singapore, with a special emphasis on learning and education. As such, our research focuses on domains such as those pertaining to the predispositions of learning, the prerequisites of thinking, social emotional development, numeracy, literacy, interactions and relationships in family, childcare and kindergarten settings. For now, we work with populations beginning with infancy all the way to middle childhood. We have been blessed to be able to collaborate with many wonderful partners, including the Early Childhood Development Agency, ACDA, the Ministry of Education Preschool Branch, the National Institute of Early Childhood Development, NIEC, and many major early childhood operators. CRCD has also been very honored to be able to collaborate and consult with some of the leading experts in the field of child and human development internationally. Being a relatively new research center, we are truly thankful to have benefited greatly from the guidance and the expert advice of some of the most established and experienced research leaders worldwide. So I would like to especially thank three of them for being here today. Thank you to you, our three guest speakers, Professor Richie Poulton, Professor Catherine McBride, Professor Marinus Eisendorn, for honoring us with your presence today to share with us your valuable experiences and insights. We are all excited and looking forward to hear your sharing. I'm sure we will all have a great time this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, Prof Tan, for your opening address and starting our webinar on such a great note. Now let's get started with our first sharing of the day by Professor Richie Poulton. So Prof Poulton has been a director of Dunedin Multidisciplinary Health and Development Research Unit since 2000, heading the large-scale Dunedin Multidisciplinary Health and Development Study, an ongoing longitudinal study that has been tracking the lives of children to adulthood for almost half a century, making him well-poised to share with us some of his valuable insights today. Throughout his career, he has taken on multiple important appointments, such as research professor at University of Otago in Dunedin School of Medicine in 2006, where he subsequently also became professor in the Department of Psychology in 2015. Aside from these duties, Prof. Poulton serves on many New Zealand government, public and academic statutory bodies and is a consultant internationally. In 2014, he was appointed as Chief Science Advisor to the New Zealand Ministry of Social Development and in 2018 was appointed as the science, Chief Science Advisor to the Minister of Child Poverty Reduction, who also happens to be the Prime Minister of New Zealand, Jacinta Ardern. He is also the recipient of many prestigious awards, such as the Dunedin School of Medicine Dean's Medal for Research Excellence in 2014. In 2017, he was made a Companion of the New Zealand Order of Merit for his services to science and health research. He is also one of the only two New Zealanders to have been listed as the top 1% of highly cited researchers worldwide every year since 2014. So may I invite Prof. Poulton, please, to give his uh, presentation. 
Kia ora, tato everyone. Um, welcome to this webinar from the deep south. I'm in a place called Dunedin, which is the bottom of the South Island of New Zealand. And we are still in winter as well as in full lockdown. So it is nice to be doing something different than rattling around my own house, waiting for the lockdown to be lifted. Tonight, I want to very quickly run through some research that we've done in the Dunedin study uh, to um, basically expand on the uh, issue of social emotional um, development that Prof Tan mentioned in his introduction. Uh, next slide, please. Very quickly, the mean studies of 1,037 babies who were born at the only maternity hospital in our town in one year between April the 1st, 1972 and March 30, 1973, so a 12-month period. As you can see on the left-hand column of that slide, this group of people, which are from all walks of life, in other words, it's a representative general population sample, and that's part of its strength, um, have been assessed every couple of years as they were growing up because the amount of developmental change is quite significant every few years. And as they hit their middle teen years, we spread out our assessments a little through to the mid twenties and then made them slightly less frequent through their middle, early adulthood to middle adult years. Uh, we most recently saw our cohort when they were all aged 45. That was done over a two year period. And the right hand column reveals that for all but one assessment when the children were 13, we've managed to retain pretty much the whole cohort intact. This is not because I should say New Zealanders um, just sit around in their home, the place they were born, waiting to be re-enrolled in the study. Um, it's far from it. We're a, we're a country of travellers. Uh, and at age 45 or age 45, 24% of our study participants lived outside of New Zealand. So we had to fly them back to New Zealand where they underwent a full day and a half of assessments, including brain imaging, on just about every topic you can think of. They're a very um, altruistic and patient group of people, and they are the heroes of this enterprise, not us as the researchers. They're the ones that remain committed and have given so much so that we can try and understand uh, a little bit more about good and not so good human development. Next slide, please. So I'm gonna to talk today uh, about a paper we published recently um, that examined the relationship between what we call childhood self-control, one could call that self-regulation or social emotional skill. There are different ways of describing this capacity depending on your disciplinary background, but we call it self-control. And basically it's the ability to control your emotions rather than have them control you so that you can then pursue goals and persist in the face of challenge and the achievement of those goals. And previous work has shown that the level of this capacity that you have as a child, and by child, I'm talking about measurements that were taken at age three, five, seven, nine, and 11 from multiple different sources, had predicted how well you were doing in life by the time you got to your early 30s in terms of your mental health, your physical health, your relationships, the quality of relationships, be they intimate or with children, if you had children at that point, your ability to remain out of jail and pro-social, your ability to obtain and maintain good employment, your avoidance of becoming dependent on social benefits or overusing other social sector uh, services, such as health services. So there were a lot of things that were associated by the mid thirties with how much self-control you had as a child. And in simple terms, because we're a um, normative population sample, we divided our cohort into five groups ranging from the lowest quintile right through to the highest quintile. What we found was a graded association in the earlier papers with all those outcomes I just mentioned. In other words, the lower the self-control, the more likely you were to have poor outcomes. There was no point, however, that you got to in the distribution that you did not accrue benefits if you had higher levels of self-control. This suggested to us at the time that this is not a situation where there's a small segment of the population that have problems, 
rather this was a graded association and that the whole population could probably benefit from interventions early in life during the childhood years uh, to promote and strengthen self-control. So we've extended that work and that's what I'm going to talk about today very briefly. What we did when our study members was, were um, age 45 is collect a lot of information about um, aging indicators uh, and a lot of information about preparedness for advanced years, preparedness for the aging process per se. Uh, in simple terms, you can group these into four categories, what we call aging or accelerated aging, made up of um, a measure of pace of aging, which was something that we first wrote about in 2015. We used 20, uh, 19 biomarkers measured at age 26, 32, 38, and 45 to track individuals' rate of deterioration in 19 biomarkers in indexing multiple physiological systems. In other words, whilst they were all the same age at age 45 chronologically, some people had aged at a much faster rate than you would expect, and they were effectively the age of 70-year-olds, whereas some had slowed aging and were effectively the age of 30-year-olds, but they were chronologically age 45. We then used a computer AI approach to measure from structural brain imaging um, brain age. We measured also through the MRI scans, white matter hyperintensities, which is vessel weakening and comes up as white spots in the brain. We measured directly gait speed via a new technique in which people walk at a normal rate. They walk with um, a interference task where they have to say um, certain things backwards as they are walking and they walk at their fastest possible spate, uh, uh, speed. This was shown to relate to a whole bunch of age-related indicators. And we also had people who didn't know the study members rate their facial age in two different ways. So that's our measure of pace of aging um, and or accelerated aging. The combination of all those um, uh, measures uh, were, uh, was obtained via principal components analysis, and we present data in the next um, uh, set of slides um, in, in which we show the relationship between the overall composite of all measures as well as the individual components. Let's talk about the next measure of preparedness, please. Next slide. Health preparedness. So we asked people questions about their health literacy, really. Uh, questions like, why is it important that you use your antibiotics until the whole jar is empty? Or why is it important and how does it help if you know something about your family health history? So these were very practical questions to try and tap into a person's general understanding of health issues. We measured using a standardized scale, a pessimism about the aging process. And we also got people to predict the likelihood of living to the age of 75. Again, we uh, did a principal component analysis and we came up with an overall measure because all those three measures correlated with each other as well as looked at the individual component parts in terms of their relationship with childhood self-control. Next slide, please. Financial preparedness. So we did a, a financial literacy um, test or assessment. We asked people, for example, what happens to your um, bank balance when inflation rates are high? Or, uh, for example, why is it that people invest in multiple different types of investments instead of just sticking to one the diversification principle? We also measured um, how much playfulness had occurred in people's lives, how much, whether they were in um, superannuation schemes, how much they had in their bank account, um, plans for the future, and so on. We got formal credit scores from credit rating agencies as well, and then had informants with the study member's permission tell us about um, the financial uh, difficulties that our study members were having. Next slide, please. Measured social preparedness. Uh, we all want to belong. That's a basic human need. And we, so we measured using structured um, questionnaires recognized in the literature as valid to measure social integration and support. We also uh, measured directly the extent of loneliness that people were experiencing in their lives. And finally, we measured life satisfaction. Again, all three were correlated highly with each other. So we also created a principal component, a summary measure, if you will, as well as looked at the relationship with individual component parts as seen here. What did we find? 
Now, there's a very busy slide. Next, please. And I don't want you to try and read it all. I'm just going to give you a hint as to what's most important. In the first um, column of figures, you can see on the left-hand side the variables I just described grouped into their four categories. You can see that the um, relationship between levels of childhood self-control between the ages of three and 11, and how they scored on those different domains at age 45 were significantly associated. That's the first column. And you can see the size of the effect in the beta values. It varies, but all are significant, wildly so. And then we adjusted for two, fundament two recognized fundamental causes of life or influences on life outcomes. That is childhood socioeconomic status, again, measured across multiple ages during childhood, not just once, uh, and also childhood IQ, again, shown in the literature to be strongly predictive of how successful people's lives turn out, again, measured on multiple occasions, not just one off. And you can see that despite adjustment for childhood social class and IQ, the association between level of child self-control ranging from low to high and those outcomes on the left-hand side, accelerated aging is the principal component or composite score at the top of each category, as well as the individual component parts, all remain significant bar two, and that is brain age and the white matter hyperintensities. But across all the other constituent parts, as well as categories, you still have a strong, clear relationship between level of childhood self-control and outcomes at 45, so midlife, that's more than a third of a century later. And we thought that was pretty unusual and pretty compelling. And it underpinned our earlier messages about the great importance for um, life outcomes across multiple domains and in multiple possible ways of this thing called self-control or social emotional skill, Prof, Prof Tan mentioned earlier. The other thing I want to mention today briefly is um, the essential malleability of this thing called self-control. In other words, you can teach it or improve it or strengthen it. Next slide, please. We did this by looking at the rank order between childhood height as a comparator, which we know is pretty stable, and adult height. And you can see that the rank order from childhood to adult was pretty high, about 0.8. Same with IQ, and we know that. If you know about IQ, we know it's reasonably stable. In between, um, social and class and self-control, um, uh, you see the correlations are about 0 0.3, 0 0.4. In other words, uh, whilst we get strong prediction from childhood, there is quite a lot of change in rank order. In other words, self-control, like social class, is malleable, it can change. It can change for the worse, but it can also change for the better. And where you see a great deal of disconnection between childhood and adulthood is in, as you might expect, as a control in the other direction to that we've obtained via height, accidental injuries, which by definition are, well, they're accidental, aren't they? So the good news here is one, that investment in, Levels of childhood self-control, and there are interventions shown to work to improve and strengthen self-control very early in life. Preschool was is ideal, but don't stop there. Go through to childhood and beyond. But also, it opens the door on a possibility that you're never too late to change, to make a positive change. In other words, these data relate to people midlife. Now, some might say the horse is bolted, these data suggest that maybe it hasn't bolted. So you should start early, but from a policy and resource allocation perspective, do not delude yourself that by starting early and doing a good job in the first years of life, the job is completely done. There are opportunities further down the life course to make meaningful improvements in levels of self-regulation and control that can meaningfully predict um, a healthy, um, longer and happier second half of the life, life course. And on that note, I'll leave it. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Prof. Thank you. Colton. Now I will introduce our next speaker, Professor Catherine McBride. Prof. McBride is a leading developmental psychologist at the Chinese University of Hong Kong. 
and the founding president for the Association for Reading and Writing in Asia. She specializes in reading development and impairment across cultures and has published on a variety of topics, including parenting, creativity, child abuse, peer relations, and children's literacy development, amassing publications in over 200 peer-reviewed journal articles, book chapters, and books. Prof. McBride is currently the principal investigator of a longitudinal twin study, which aims to understand how genetic and environmental factors are associated in literacy development of young children. Some of her other recent research include a 10-year-plus longitudinal study of language and literacy development in Chinese children in Hong Kong and Beijing, as well as research on the importance of dialogic reading for early learning in children. Prof. McBride has also done a variety of work as an editor, where she currently serves as an associate editor for the International Journal of Behavioral Development. So without further ado, may I invite Prof. McBride, please. Thank you very much. It's a great honor to be here today with such distinguished company. Uh, and I'm really excited about um, sharing with you. Uh, uh, and now I'm going to uh, give my talk. Um, let's see. I do research in literacy. This very kind introduction uh, highlighted that, and I'm very happy to talk about um, any research related to literacy in the Q&A. But right now I'm gonna talk about um, impact. And I come from Hong Kong, where there's a big influence from the British um, tradition. And they have something called the research assessment exercise, which is very focused on trying to establish um, impact in a particular way. I'm going to try to talk about what I've done. Some of it's related to RAE and some of it is just um, kind of my interests over the years. So this PowerPoint will be available to those who are interested in reading the different, different definitions I took the RAE research assessment exercise definition um, from the UK uh, because it was the one that we uh, had to focus on for the last couple of years. Um, but basically the idea of social impact is going beyond academia. Um, and you can define it in many different ways, but trying to help groups, um, trying to promote whatever you've learned through your own research, um, so that it benefits others. Um, there is academic impact as well. And um, in the introduction, it was mentioned that we have this Association for Reading and Writing in Asia, which some of you on this um, Zoom call, I know are participating in, and thank you so much. Um, but what we're gonna focus on particularly today is like families, children, um, what our research uh, says and how it can help um, th those groups. Why should you care? Why bother with social impact? I think a lot of people in this field would be surprised by that question, but I think it's a reasonable question to ask given that everybody is so busy um, and given that academia often is very taxing and there are so many demands on your time. So for us here in Hong Kong, one thing is it is a university requirement over time that some of us uh, focus on this. But that's just the beginning. Most people who are doing really well in social impact did not start because it was a university requirement. They started many years ago. Um, I think it's value added. I think you can, um, you know, we're always, wherever you are, we're always kind of in the, uh, a discussion with the public, you know, should we get grant money? Why, what are we doing to be helpful? Um, it can be helpful in influencing your own status um, you can learn new things for research. One of the most interesting things I've done is to teach a program for teachers of English. These are English teachers in Hong Kong, primary school teachers. They get, they've given me lots of ideas for new research because they had particular questions that I hadn't thought of because I'm not a, uh, a primary school teacher. And so I've learned so much from them. What's the return on money uh, for your grants? Uh, Science for Good, one example, uh, inspired by New Zealand, Marie Clay has a program called Reading Recovery, 
which doesn't have a lot of scientific support. Um, and in this case, it's good to, you know, reconsider when you find those kinds of things. There's lots of new technology, new ways to uh, communicate with others um, that can have make some impact. And also APA ethics, one of the main um, aspects is fidelity and responsibility. We want to contribute a little bit of our time um, to others. These are my forms of impact uh, that I'm going to talk about. And I think the first one that uh, most people would be relatively comfortable starting with is media. Um, but we've also done some work that has highlighted the importance of assessment or led to new ways of assessing. Also some intervention that took place in the Philippines, in Cebu in the Philippines. Um, we've also produced a massive open online course, uh, which was very, very interesting and helpful in learning a lot around the world. And then we have an invention. We have a little uh, card game based on our research. Uh, so here are my examples. The first one is media. I really think it's difficult to talk to the media, but I think it's essential. Any students who are doing your dissertations, kind of whatever you have to say and, and the detail and the care with which you say it um, is very important. In talking to the media, you have to have a very different approach. You have to be factual, but you also have to be convincing, clear, um, kind of reasonable to anyone and that, so that anyone can understand you very quickly. It's very hard to talk to the media, but when you do, it can be helpful. Um, in Hong Kong, we had a blog for a while called Early Literacy for Chinese Children. We were very happy that the child assessment um, services in Hong Kong made use of it. They recommended it to um, many of their clients whose kids had dyslexia. One of my favorite examples of this is from The Conversation, which is an outlet um, that's in several countries. This one was in Australia. I teamed up with a linguist who's one of my favorite people, Kate Burridge, because she she had given a talk that I heard and I had an answer for her talk. Basically, she was talking about how to pronounce the letters of the alphabet. And I was telling her, well, there is a correct way to pr pr pronounce the word H. I'm American, so I say H, but the correct way to pronounce it is actually H. And I mentioned this in particular because we wrote that. I thought it was a trivial little piece. It got 80,000 you know, responses or likes uh, in the media. That was interesting. Books too. I've tried to write a couple books that were more for public use or for undergrads um, at that kind of a level. Um, and that's something I have to say. I, I can say more about media if you're interested. I think you really have to start there by convincing people of what you're doing. Another thing is assessment. In Hong Kong, we're special. If you've read any of my work, in literacy, you know, like Hong Kong is different from any other Chinese society in that children begin formal reading training at three and a half years old. It's like two years before other Chinese kids and way earlier than many kids in other cultures. For that reason, we really need an early screening scale because if you get those children at age six, they've already been failing at reading for two and a half to three years. So some of our research, including um, aspects of morphological awareness, which is kind of something that I've worked on a lot in research, um, has made up this scale. And it's um, being used by clinicians and educational psychologists and hopefully screening those kids earlier and getting them help earlier. A third aspect is intervention. So we've done some work in the Philippines where we do a parent training um, program. It's sponsored by the Arcanist Early Learning Foundation, and then it was taken over by the International Care Ministry. So now thousands of families have used it. It's basically like uh, focused on uh, teaching parents with just like a card game about how to talk to their children about early math. And then we've been able to look at um, how that training relates to children outcomes and also parents outcomes and their feelings about parenting. The MOOC that we did was also based on the books that I showed you before. We, we had 
across two sessions of it, we had 10,000 people uh, sign up. And it was quite exciting because for this particular MOOC, it was free, which is great. So anybody, uh, 100 people in 100 countries signed up. Most of them were parents or teachers. And the best thing about it was it was only held over about eight weeks. There were about six different sessions. Um, and we had people um, conversing with each other. And I have to say, in the world that we're in right now, it was just a great feeling to log on and see people chatting with one another. It was only in English. So it was like only a, a subset of teachers, obviously. But teachers in you know various countries telling each other about their techniques and suggesting things to other people in other countries about, about how to do that. We also have a, like a company. We created something that we call bumper cards. Um, this is also based on research that I've done on morphological awareness. It's a card game where we hope to enhance kids' Chinese and English, basically by making compound words. But the trick is you can make creative words, you can draw them, you can explain them. It enhances creativity as well as word learning. And this is a picture of our box. Um, and again, this is after about 20 years of doing this. We finally came up and I deliberately created a card game. It was very important to me that we not do an app. Everybody does apps. This is supposed to be a game that's interactive where kids trade cards and um, make new words and talk about their ideas based on these words. We also have a, a book that's based on this. We call it Wordplay. Again, it's all about compound words and it's a bilingual um, little book of stories where kids can draw pictures or write about the new words that they come up with. After a long time, people said, okay, now you have to do an app. So we, tried, we also tried to do an app. This is a picture of our Morpho game, which we have online now in a, a short version. And our Morpho game, I think, is interesting because you have to, you know, use words, match them to create compound words. But then there's another part that doesn't show here, which is you have to say whether that's a real word or a creative word. So we have a lot of pictures in our Morpho game, which are fantastic, crazy ideas like, uh, you know, like uh, what, what would be one example? Ice cookie. What's an ice cookie? Well, you see the picture, you guess, you know, from the words below, you make up the word ice cookie and you say that that's a creative word, not a real word. So it's focused on word learning, but it's also, we hope, sort of a fun idea um, similar to the bumper cards. So what have I learned from all these different aspects of um, practicality and social impact? You have to be very flexible. Doing social impact has been the most difficult aspect of my career, for sure. Um, all the longitudinal studies, all the other research interventions have been difficult, but social impact is the most difficult. Uh, and I think a lot of that is because I'm trying to create things based on research, but a lot of, um, a lot of the reaction is, well, that, that's, that's not going to work here. That doesn't make sense. And so I'm trying to find ways to talk to the public to explain why it's reasonable or easy. It's not easy. Um, I don't think I have time to go over all of these, but the trajectory is far from linear. I started out with a friend of mine who's a, he, what, he approached me. He wasn't a friend. I didn't know him. But uh, this guy from Switzerland who was like a high school graduate um, who had a company and had a vision of doing um, parenting training, and it took us 20 years to do it. Writing for the public is difficult. Social media is also difficult and unpredictable. I have lots of stories about websites that crashed, blogs that are difficult to sustain, books that are reaching out to the public, um, but the publishers aren't that interested in the public. They're more interested in academics. Um, so lots of things and, um, gathering evidence for social impact is difficult. These are some suggestions for that. And, um, I'm very happy to talk to you more about that. If you're interested in like an RAE type of situation, but in general, I just want to say, um, I'm very happy engaging in social impact. And it's one of the toughest things that I think an academic 
can engage in, but it's worth it. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. McBride. So now we have our last speaker, Professor Marinus Van Eijendon. Prof. Eijendon is an Emeritus Professor of Child and Family Studies at the University of Leiden and also Professor of Human Development at Erasmus University, Rotterdam, Netherlands. He is currently co-PI of the Healthy Start, Happy Start Randomized Control Trial led by Paul Ramchandani in Cambridge, as well as co-PI of Generation R a large longitudinal cohort study at Erasmus University, Rotterdam. Prof. Eisendorn studies the social, psychological, and neurobiological determinants of parenting and child development, with special emphasis on attachment, emotion regulation, differential susceptibility, and child maltreatment. He is ranked in the top 0.01% of scientists based on the PLOS One Journal Impact Rankings in 2019. His research was a big part of PEARL, the program for emotion regulation and attachment research in Leiden University, which was one of the most cutting edge and high quality research programs of its time. Prof. Eisendorn is currently an honorary senior visiting fellow in the primary care unit and member of the Applied Social Sciences Group. He is also a visiting scholar at Sydney Sussex College. May I invite Prof. Eisendorn, please? Thank you so much for your very kind introduction. Uh, can you hear me? Um, I um, would like yes. to talk uh, this uh, morning here in the Netherlands, uh, at your place, uh, it's uh, afternoon, for, oh, about the uh, replication crisis uh, and the translational issues that uh, brings this about. And what I would like to show first is that there is a great trust in science. Uh, the red line, it's a large survey study here. The red line shows how large this trust is across many, many decades. Uh, it's uh, competing with, for example, the military. It's USA, by the way, this survey. And it's much higher uh, than, for example, the trust in press or in politics, by the way. But on the other hand, there is also a lot of skepticism within science about uh, the replication, replicability of the findings. Why most published research findings are false was a PLOS Maths in 2005 publication by Ioannidis, millions of uh, readings and 7,000 citations. Now, what is at stake here? Is it a replication crisis or are these growing pains? In the survey among 1,500 researchers, more than half agreed that it would be really a crisis. And if you look at crisis narratives in the literature, in the scientific literature, the last five years or so saw a, a massive increase of this type of terms and wordings. Something is going on here. Well, one of the causes is that some of the most widely read introductory textbook examples of uh, studies uh, seem to be non-replicable. This is the study by Strack about this facial expression determining emotions uh, of happiness, for example, if you look at cartoons. It's a very simple experiment, but the replication in 17 independent studies showed a no effect, although this was a widely cited finding. So what about, in general, psychological research and its replicability? It's depending upon the sample size, mostly, not only, but mostly. And what we notice in the literature is that there's many, many papers with too low statistical power. I'm not going to any technical detail, but only 8% of the studies have adequate power, uh, large enough 
samples to have um, replicable findings, in principle, replicable findings. And there's a large heterogeneity because there's no coordination between different research teams going on in this field. And not only in this field, by the way, there's also a problematic situation uh, diagnosed in, for example, the very basic research, preclinical cancer research. 53 so-called groundbreaking experiments seem to be uh, mostly, most of them uh, irreplicable. And the same is true for imaging studies, neuroscientific studies. A very small set of samples have sufficient power to have reproducible uh, findings. And the same is true for very fundamental research on rodents, in this case on maternal deprivation, an area that I have been involved in the last five years. Two small samples and non-replicable findings is a big risk. Now, one of the other reasons besides this small sample issue is that we have this obsessive compulsive adherence to P is 0.05. And it was already Rosnow and Rosdal in 1989 who argued, well, surely God loves the PO6 nearly as much as the PO5. Uh, what happens is that most senior researchers and advisors of PhD students do not believe so much in this verdict by God. And the PhDs and postdocs are feeling urged to find so-called significant results that might not be replicable through, for example, p-hacking, finding p-values just below the threshold through fishing expeditions. And that's a, one of the causes of the replication crisis. Too many researcher degrees of freedom leading to fishing expeditions and one of the uh, potential solutions, for example, proposed in this book, free to download by the National Academy of Sciences, Engineering and Medicine, USA, is pre-registration of studies. Certainly that's an important requirement in, in today and in the future, even more so. One of the propositions in this fat book about the replication crisis is that there's a very big need for meta-analyses to solve this replication crisis. To my surprise, and I enjoy this analysis very much because I'm involved in meta-analysis for more than four decades. Now, why most published research findings are false is not so important. It does not really matter in a certain way. If we manage to differentiate between the context of discovery and justification, as I argued in 1994. Context of discovery is free from many restrictions. Uh, there you want to have bold conjectures, according to Popper, Karl Popper, philosophy of science and others, but you also need to invest in the context of justification, the search for refutations, falsifications of proposed hypotheses. A science is kind of an evolutionary dynamics, I think, with Donald Campbell. Lots of variations are needed, hypotheses, suggestions that are turning out to be false, and a few will survive strict selection criteria by empirical research and meta-analysis, and those are important for, for example, translation. This this model of cumulative research program that I think is so important to keep in mind if you set up a research program. It's starting with a primary analysis, a single study, but single studies do not tell you much. They have to be reanalyzed, they have to be replicated, and only out of the context of the discovery into justification, you get findings that are robust enough to really apply in policy and clinical and other practices. So that's important to keep in mind the translation, only warranted in the context of justification, firmly grounded in meta-analytic synthesis. And one little example is our VIPPSD positive parenting program, an intervention program that took three decades to develop and test 
several uh, research teams in the world have been working on it as well. It's combining two research traditions, Bowie Ains with attachment theory and Patterson's ideas about coercive cycles, let's say social learning approach, together with Marianne Parkhans Kranenberg and Van Juffer and many, many others, we did develop this program. And what we have been doing is in relatively short period of time, only six sessions of one hour at home, uh, make a protocol focusing on sensitivity enhancement and the enhancement of sensitive limit setting, which is very important for the terrible twos and the terrible threes and all the uh, children, of course. Uh, there's new developments, by the way, going on, but uh, the VIPP has, has been used in uh, examples with autistic children, uh, child abusive families, uh, depressive uh, parents, and uh, children at risk for externalizing behavior problems, et cetera, et cetera. But we are now in the process, or we see uh, currently a process going on around uh, VIPP adapted to the school system with teachers, uh, University of Cambridge and Faya University of Amsterdam, prenatally starting uh, v uh, VIPP pre video feedback with expectant fathers, and uh, very important also virtual VIPP and online training delivery of VRPP that makes it more useful for African, South Asian countries, Asian countries that have problems to attend physically. And, and of course, during the, own, the um, a pandemic, it's very important to have this type of facilities. Now, we are in the process to do a meta-analysis on the available evidence in randomized controlled trials of the effects of this VRPP, first of all, on positive parenting. And what we found, 24 randomized control trials, almost 2,000 families children involved, an effect size of 0.37. D is the standardized difference between experimental and control group. Now, is that sufficient for application in policy practice, for example, in prevention, well, baby clinics, for example? We think it is, because if you look at the uh, criteria, of course, the Cohen criteria are generic and very high bars. But if you look at Kraft's uh, recent criteria taken from educational interventions, point 20 <coughs> is already uh, considered to be a strong effect size. And we um, managed to get a point 37. And it's maybe of interest to read this Kraft paper because he has some very original reasoning for his very low, so to say, very low standards for effect sizes. By fifth grade, student achievement improves only 0.4 standard deviation or less. And the schools account only for 40% of these achievement gains. Formal schooling, more than 1,000 hours per year, and lots of dollars uh, or other currencies for children. So we could be satisfied with an effect size of 0.37. What Kraft is doing is trying to um, draft a three-dimensional kind of decision model for what is worthwhile to implement in policy or practice with effect size, effectiveness, and scalability as the three dimensions. But I feel, and we worked uh, we, uh, elaborate on that in our recent piece in NDCAD, uh, Marianne Bakermans Kranberg, that there is more to the effectiveness, to uh, the um, implementability than only effectiveness. It's also cost benefit. Benefit means benefactum is a ethical issue. And that's a more important issue, the more uh, we are reaching the point that we are going to apply knowledge in policy context and other practical context. Value ladenness has to be taken into account and we can do it by bringing together the practitioners, policy makers and researchers in uh, coordinated efforts in teams in which both parties have very specific responsibilities, expertise and tasks. The orange part is for researchers and the green part for the practitioners and policymakers to bring into the discussion. 
And when they come together, then you have a firm foundation for translation to practice and policy. So in sum, what do we need to address the replication and translation crisis? Sharper distinction in context of discovery and justification, pre-registration of studies with details about hypothesis, methods, and analysis, more cooperation within teams, across teams, across universities, meta-analysis and IPDs, translation to practice and policy on firm meta-analytic evidence base, and starting cooperation between researchers and policy makers, practitioners at an early stage to bridge the gap between is and all. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you, Prof. Aijan Dorn. Now we will go ahead uh, with our panel discussion and Q&A segment of our three guest speakers. So people in the audience do submit your questions you have in the Slido Q&A page rather than in the Zoom chat so that we can flash the questions up on the screen during the discussion. The Slido URL and QR code will be shared. Do note that, however, not all questions may be brought up to the panelists due to time constraints. So uh, without further ado, I will hand over the time to Associate Prof. Kenneth Poon, who will be moderating the session. Yeah. Prof. Kenneth. Thanks, Jolene. Uh, I think in over the short hour, what we have done is that we have um, talks, uh, reporting study findings, we have explored um, channels for research translation, and we have also explored larger questions about the generalizability of research. So uh, I don't know about you, but my head is a buzz with ideas, with questions. And um, I saw, um, even as the talks were going on, um, there were questions posted um, early on the chat. So um, in this segment, um, like what Jolene was saying, uh, we are using the Slido platform to post our questions. So uh, you see on the screen that we have shared here the, the, the QR code that you can use to access the, sli the Slido platform. And we have also the link down there. So um, as we start to warm up, this, this first question is actually from, from me. Uh, so, um, and I'm rewording it slightly differently, okay? So uh, as, as I listen, and, and this is addressed to all three members of the panel. So as I listen to your talks, um, I think the, the theme of research impact, which is the application of uh, research findings to practice and policy um, comes out. So uh, Prof. Richie Poulton, you talked about the impact of your research to uh, policy. I, I, we can see that very evident. And there's also indication uh, in the synopsis of uh, how your research has resulted in um, an intervention program, which is current, which, which is being evaluated by an RCT. Um, Prof. Catherine McBride, you had spoken about um, creating social impact um, in research. Um, and Prof. Um, Mariners and Ben Eisendorn, uh, you draw attention to what we need to look at when we seek um, to apply findings to uh, practice and policy. So my, my question actually is that, uh, you know, the, the, the runway between research and uh, translation can be long. Um, I think um, over the course of our work down here, we have found that sometimes it can take as long as 17 years. I think that's one number that's been posted. So uh, we, in Singapore, we're always looking for shortcuts. Uh, what do you think then uh, is one way that researchers, practitioners, and policymakers can do to shorten this, this pathway to research translation? Um, or is this merely a pursuit um, of the Holy Grail? So um, I, I wonder, I'd like to hear your thoughts on that. And um, I wonder if uh, Prof. Richie Poulton would be happy to start. Uh, Prof. Polden, I think you are muted. I am. I, I'm no longer <laughs> muted, I hope. Yes. But thanks, Ken. Um, my answer will be deceptively simple and straightforward, but the actioning of it is more complex. But it doesn't re require research skill. My answer is to knock on doors. In other words, to get outside of your research environment, to go to the buildings where 
the policymakers and the politicians live and work and knock on their door and keep knocking until they let you in and then have lots of coffees with these people, talking to them about what their priorities are. All right, don't you come with the attitude that you know exactly what they want and the hope of selling it to them. Go to the people that are charged by the station they hold, the office they hold, with actually doing things at the coalface, be they policymakers or be they practitioners who deliver, and their masters, the politicians, and listen humbly to what their priorities are. And then you can see what is likely to be picked up because it has high potential as something that the government wants to invest in, government at every level. Now, why am I saying this? Well, it's because I spent seven years as a chief science advisor in New Zealand, where I had the ability to directly walk into ministers' offices and have these discussions every week for the last seven years. And I was struck that over that time, my colleagues in the academy, particularly my own university, went from being very doubtful about what I'd done in accepting that position, wondering, quite dismissively, I must say, why would you bother, um, to becoming quite interested and perplexed, though, as to how you get in the door. And I said, it's not rocket science. Just get yourself on a plane and go and meet these people. They are just human beings. And if you make a good case as to why you want to talk to them, because you have something to offer potentially, they more than likely will find some time at some point. You may have to try for a longer period of time than you would like. Or as, as Cammy alluded to, you've got to keep trying. This is hard work. No particular pathway or route is perfect and it won't ever work first time. But it's not a mysterious thing. Get out there and ask and talk to people that you want to be able to um, connect with and find out what they want. And sadly, for too long, I've watched my colleagues exhibit academic hubris. That is, if, they, if these people only knew what was good for them, and they always seem surprised when the politicians aren't particularly interested in, in their special finding, which is, of course, from their point of view, the best thing since sliced bread. All right. These people have all sorts of folk in their ear. They have constituents from every walk of life. And they are, at the end of the day, are politicians. So you've got to get out there and compete. It's not for them to listen to you. It's for you to convey to them why they should be bothered listening. And it's done the old fashioned way face-to-face, -face, and don't take no for an answer. Thanks so much. This is such an important thing you say. And, um, and I mean, it makes so much sense. Um, and uh, it's something that um, if, if we were to walk through the entire journey in grad school, uh, we don't hear of it at all. Um, but um, uh, this, this is so important. Thank you so much for highlighting this point. Uh, Prof. Um, Catherine McBride, um, do you have any other thoughts to share on this area? I think writing for the public is important. You can make your own website. You can write for newspapers. You can write for blogs. I just did my first podcast like six weeks ago because some university students asked me to. But any way that you can talk to the public and practice that. Because I teach a course on writing and presentation to graduate students, and I always tell them, writing a paper and writing for the public, they're not the opposite of one another, but they're very, very different ways to communicate. But both are essential these days. Um, and I think that if you do that, at least a couple important people will, you know, notice what you're doing or what you're saying and, and take that up. I think what uh, Professor Poulton said is very important, but uh, it also depends where you are, maybe Singapore and, and, and Hong Kong and New Zealand are a bit smaller, but also in bigger countries, for example, you have to wait a while till you can get that kind of attention. But the more you try to practice, I hate talking to the press, I really do, but, but practice trying to communicate what you're doing and why, 
And for some people, maybe what you're working on isn't directly very practical, but it's theoretically important for something that will lead to somewhere. So I think everybody can do that. And I think that that's important given all the social media these days. Thank you so much. Um, communicating with the press. I think that's just another uh, very, very important piece that um, uh, we, we sometimes find hard. I mean, I'm, I'm in the middle of um, trying to craft a reply right now and it's, it's difficult. Um, I wonder whether uh, Prof. Mariners um, Van Eisen don't have anything else to add um, to this very, very interesting topic. Well, um, my tack on this is a little bit different. I, I guess uh, I really believe uh, that uh, we don't have shortcuts. Uh, slow science and s slow and cautionary applications. I think that's what um, uh, we should realize that really is required here because we have to do a lot of housekeeping in science uh, broadly and not only in psychological science or educational science, but also in the biomedical science, et cetera. And I think uh, what we should really work on is, for example, working in larger teams, uh, consortia to elevate the level of replicability of our findings. And then surely there are areas in which there's a possibility of uh, application. Recently, I was involved in a discussion on the basis of two Lancet papers on uh, orphanages, on, on institutionalization and deinstitutionalization that we wrote. And, and now there's coming in all kinds of invitation by N NGOs and, and ministries uh, across the world to uh, give some guidance on how to implement those findings. I think there is this possibility uh, and maybe we could s uh, speed it up a little bit by creating panels of practitioners and policy makers in an early stage of setting up a research program, in the stage of uh, trying to create a broad question and see how that could be addressed in a series of studies that have to be. So it's a bit of implementation of the model that I showed, of cooperation, but um, be mindful that you do it at a very early stage in this uh, type of research. Thank you so much. So um, the, the need for us to be working in teams, um, to be very systematic, and also to be communicating. Again, um, this is this very powerful word with um, uh, other stakeholders, um, not just um, at, um, after the research, but um, in the entire conceptualization process. I think that's, that's, that's um, such a gem of wisdom. Thank you so much. Um, we, we have um, questions um, being posted now. And um, as the questions emerge, uh, for those of you who are listening in, um, you can on the Slido platform also boost some questions up by voting for them. So these will move the questions, which um, uh, we will find more interest in um, moving up the, the list. Um, and, and if I can look at the first question on the list now, this is um, addressed to Richie. Uh, thank you for the very interesting sharing. Some articles use the term self-regulation and self-control um, interchangeably, while others dis discuss regulation as part of control. Uh, what are your thoughts on this? That's a good observation. Um, uh, self-regulation, emotion regulation, self-control, conscientiousness, um, delayed gratification, impulsivity, intertemporal choice, Depending on your disciplinary background, people will use different terminology to describe this, the basic phenomenology, which is about controlling your emotions so that you can then think through and pursue a plan of action in the pursuit of a goal. Now, some people also talk about executive function at a higher level as being the same as self-control. I think there's a, a need for um, a um, sort of a taxonomy, a term, terminology, if you will, of what refers to what, and then more consistent use. Right now, so long as a person defines what they mean by a term, in terms of behaviors or observations or measures, by what trade they're trying to um, assess, that's sufficient to make sense of the published literature, but it would be much nicer to have agreement as to what is what and what we should call these things. Executive function is like the broad church, which covers uh, impulse control, 
self-control probably is what I, I would call it. Um, memory um, is part of it. You need a good memory. And then you need a, um, a language around or capacity to um, uh, label and process information relevant to the outcomes of interest. So um, it's a work in progress. I think someone made the point earlier about this, you know, science is an evolution. Uh, this continues to evolve. Um, but I think it's becoming more important in, the, in this particular area simply because of the widespread interest in this particular capacity, particularly in early life and the ability to strengthen um, that skill. And thank goodness it is a skill. I mean, we are born with genetic um, endowment to, and we differ in all sorts of ways as human beings. And we differ in terms of our innate self-control ability, but we can learn just like children learn to play the violin or to play soccer or to draw and paint. Uh, it's a skill. And the more you practice it, like most other things, the more you practice it and the more places you practice it in, the stronger it will become. I hope that answers the question. <laughs> Thanks so much. Um, I'm, I'm just actually about to uh, have a lecture on... on um, executive functioning, I think next week um, to some students. And I think uh, particularly to uh, young students, um, st students who are starting out, this, this um, um, terms can be very confusing. So thank you so much for um, clarifying these terms and to talk about how they are very frequently related to each other. Thanks, thanks, Richie. Um, we, we've got another question over here, and this, this is a question that has um, some degree of um, votes in. So um, it reads here, teacher training encompasses learning uh, psychological theories and to a much smaller extent, uh, critiquing research findings in, uh, critiquing uh, findings in research. So here's the question, should programs uh, be more heavily tailored to assessing current psychological research and reflection how to translate research findings into research practices. So this is a, a broader question on, on uh, uh, personnel preparation. Um, would, would any of you um, be interested in taking this question? I would. Kemi, yes, thank you. Thanks. And uh, I think it's a great question. And I've also spent a little bit of time reviewing grants in different places in Hong Kong and in Singapore and others. Uh, and talking to ed tech people. And so this just reminds me of a, a lot of issues related to education. So first of all, the answer is yes. Yes, that is a great idea. Um, some of the theories are relatively um, outdated and need to be reconceptualized. And so I think it's great practice to try to get people to think about, well, this is my belief, this is how I could test it or seeing how other people have tested it in a research context to evaluate whether that makes sense or not. I can talk about my own area of literacy research. Um, it's been dominated by the idea of phonological awareness in some aspects. And that makes sense a lot if you're studying French or Spanish or English. Um, it probably also makes, it also makes sense in, um, Chinese, but less so, and it depends on how it's taught. But because most of the, um, still most of the research, I would say, is more catered to English than any other language or script, uh, people always have to think about like literacy theory in relation to, to English, and sometimes it doesn't make sense. So to evaluate that kind of with a fresh perspective is good. I also think that um, sometimes it looks like you're doing something really innovative because you're technically skilled and it's beautiful and the colors are nice and the pictures are very attractive, but the theory may not be as good. And so one thing that I would like to um, encourage everyone to do is exactly what this question kind of implies. It would be really nice to spend more time understanding how research is associated with these theories, what makes sense and what does not in different cultural contexts. Thank you. Thanks so much, Kemi. I think this is a very, very good point. Um, and we have in our audience a good number of uh, professionals and people who are attending it. Um, many of them are, um, are, are teacher trainers as well as um, train, uh, 
people who are involved in the personnel preparation of people who work with young children. So this is very helpful. Thanks so much. Um, if I were to move to the next question, which is right on top, um, it reads, what are some practical ways in which we can distinguish between context of discovery versus justification? Um, so such that we can use appropriate thresholds to assess when specific interventions are worth investing in. So um, what are ways in which we can distinguish between the context of discovery versus justification so that we know uh, which interventions should be chosen? Maybe uh, I could uh, Thanks, start <coughs> yeah, trying to uh, answer this uh, question and related also to the question after that one about meta-analysis. I think that uh, it's important to look for not uh, single studies, a single experiment with very uh, nice outcomes and results, uh, highly uh, cited in major journals, uh, even then it's uh, still only one study and it should be complemented by a series of uh, replications or almost replications in the literature. And you can, I think, uh, make the differentiation as soon as there are indeed uh, quantitative syntheses of interventions in the literature. And I think that's the way in which, for example, medical doctors are working protocols to uh, have a, a certain treatment uh, spread throughout uh, different hospitals are mostly based upon Cochrane. Um, that's the kind of platform for publishing um, meta-analysis in the biomedical sciences. They are mostly based on, on meta-analysis uh, in, in, that, in that Cochrane uh, universe. So I think the same should be done in, in our type of work in early childhood education. And of course, uh, one meta-analysis is also just the beginning. I talked about the video feedback intervention that we developed and about the meta-analysis that I'm now um, working on and finalizing. This was the second uh, meta-analysis, uh, meta-analysis of three years ago. It's already outdated and insufficient. And now we did uh, an update and many more studies involved. And I think that's important to see converging evidence, also replicated evidence on the meta-analytical level. And in policy and practice, we should uh, guide, be guided by that type of, uh, of information is my firm conviction here. Thanks, Marinus. This, this is so important. Um, right now, I think uh, just a couple of weeks ago, I was involved in a team that was um, engaged in some uh, development of clinical practice guidelines. And, um, and the, these are our medical colleagues, and that's exactly what uh, um, they have been trying to do, um, employing certain standards. So um, I, I think the next question is also uh, related to the first, uh, the one I just highlighted. And so this, this talks about the relevance of meta-analysis, which is what Marinus talked about. Uh, but the question here is, um, uh, can we rely? Um, should we should policymakers exclusively uh, uh, focus exclusively on the findings of these? Um, can can we rely on these analysis? So I wonder whether um, if if, if Richie or or, or Kami or, or 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 Marinus have anything to um, uh, have any thoughts with regards to this question. Well, I'd be happy maybe uh, just okay. just. Well, just, just to uh, very briefly um, make one um, extra uh, comment here, and that is that uh, we don't have a, a lot of firm evidence based upon meta-analysis in our field, uh, uh, early childhood educational development or uh, the school system. So a lot has to be done just on intuition, uh, just... Uh, on the feelings that uh, policymakers, professionals themselves have about what is good to do. Uh, we can't sit on that uh, chance. They have to cook the meal of the day with uh, all kinds of ingredients and components. And one of those components 
hopefully is metanetic insight into a certain aspect of the field. And, and that will be one of the pillars, but not the only one, I think, in any current decision-making process in policy and practice. Thanks, Marinus. Uh, Richie, you were, you were going to say something as well. I oh, know, I was just going to um, encourage Marinus to just answer the question, which he's done nicely. <laughs> thanks, Richie. Uh, and, and thanks, Marinus. Uh, we, we do have two other questions, and I think, um, let, let me take the first one first. Um, but I suspect that um, um, more uh, Richie can uh, is address Richie. Um, let, let's start with that. Uh, so it, re it reads here, uh, for children from at-risk backgrounds, can attending preschool uh, fully compensate for their home disadvantage and close the gap with their peers? So the evidence suggests that uh, the people that come from the most at-risk backgrounds will benefit the most from interventions. However, there is not evidence, to my knowledge, that shows full compensation, as the person has written, for home disadvantage. There are significant improvements, but it's very hard to say that the playing field has been evened totally. Certainly, the last part of the question allows me to say that, yes, the gap is closing with their peers, uh, but often it is not fully closed. That will take probably longer. So what you do in school after preschool matters greatly for consolidating gains and building and strengthening those gains further. In other words, your job's not done at the end of preschool, nor is it done at the end of primary school, nor is it done by the end of secondary school. Thanks so much. Um, and this is a very important question. So I, I really would like to... Um, uh, Kami, I think Kami is ready to uh, to respond to that as well. Yes. Thank you. I unfortunately I would I just agree with Richie. I just want to take the the Hong Kong data that we have. I mean, in Hong Kong, pretty much everybody goes to preschool anyway. But the uh, when we test kids, like because kindergarten is three years here, K one, K two, K three. Even in K one, there's a difference between um, skills between those who are uh, lower socioeconomic status, poorer economically, and those who are richer within the same schools in um, English at the very beginning, in the first year. It just increases over time. Um, and school is, you know, it, the, all the kids are at the same schools. So that's the part that I'm the most worried about. Just because, And I think that's relevant for a lot of, at least Asia, because... Um, English as a foreign language is something that a lot of people need to use. So that's where the disadvantage is. It's not in Chinese or in mathematics. Um, that's just something specific from our research. But yeah, I would say it cannot fully close the gap. Thank you. Uh, sorry, I would totally agree with Catherine. I, I misunderstood the question. I thought you were talking about preschool attendees who were receiving self-regulation or self-control interventions. So I had misread the question and I now see it as if just merely turning up to preschool would deal with the problem um, or compensate for the disadvantage. Totally agree with what Catherine said. My apologies. I think especially because uh, families are very important in determining developmental trajectories and I think the confluence between school and family support is critical to uh, become closer to bridging the gap, I guess. So. And that's uh, in this question uh, a little bit left out. Agreed. And, and so just to continue, if I may, for 30 seconds, uh, and Ken mentioned this earlier, I'm involved in the establishment of a large randomised control trial in New Zealand where we um, are using as our reference group, our business as usual group, attendance at preschool and comparing that against a language intervention in one group in another group, self-regulation intervention, and in the last group, language and self-regulation. And our hypothesis is that the two forms of intervention, sole intervention, language or self-control will have benefits above business as usual, that is just merely attending. But that the combined approach 
language and self-regulation dovetailed up to the age of five will have the greatest benefit. Very, very exciting. And um, I think we are looking forward to hearing the findings of, of this study. I think that, that's, uh, I think the, the efforts um, to, to help um, reduce the risk um, experienced by um, children from, from um, different backgrounds, I think that, that, that is so important. So thanks everyone for weighing in on this, this issue. Um, if I were to look at the next question, um, now, this is a question for both Mariners as well as Kemi. Um, so is there an obligation to empirically evaluate, advise programs, communication to public before rolling it out? I don't know who's going to start. Uh, the moderator should, uh, I think, uh, regulate us here. Uh, the self-regulation is... It's, uh, it's not helping us, I guess. <laughs> well, okay, let me start. Um, and I think it's a bit different, uh, again, from the perspective of uh, Kami. Um, I think there's indeed an obligation to empirically evaluate, advise programs, communication to the public. Um, one example uh, that uh, I uh, have experienced myself is how to respond as a parent to crying behavior. Crying out loud is of course one of the major uh, vocal, uh, vocalizations of uh, infants and very important in terms of attachment. And um, uh, there was this advice based upon one study um, and it was an exploratory and a purely uh, heuristic study that you should always attend to any cry sound that you would hear from, from, from your baby. Uh, we did a, a, a replication study and found out that it's, uh, it's a little bit different, maybe, at least according to this more fine-grained uh, study that we, we performed, conducted. Now, in um, advisory books and, and papers for parents, there is still this advice, um, be quick in responding to cry sounds and cry behavior. And it's very difficult to change it on the basis of one replication that doesn't, didn't turn out to support the original study. We need really more work uh, to be able to give sound advice and not put parents already exhausted and burned out because of the birth of their first or second infant um, with advices that don't hold scrutiny. If we look carefully at the basics, at the science behind it. So I think, yes, we have a big obligation, ethical obligation, especially in uh, current times, and this is so much emphasis on, on valorization, on going to the public. Uh, my younger colleagues really are under a big pressure to, uh, to go to the public, to go to the media, to get interviewed about very preliminary results, uh, I think, well, no, this is not the way it should be done, in my opinion. Thanks so much, Marinus. Uh, Kami, have you any thoughts on this? Um, yeah, I'm assuming that if you're giving advice or talking to the public, it's from your, your expertise perspective. So I'm assuming that even if you haven't done the research, others have, it's always informed by research. So, um, but I think integrating some of that is okay. I think we can't, we, we can't get so nervous that we haven't done a study on that exact same thing. So we can't say anything about it. I think as researchers, we have an obligation to try to take the next step based on all the research that we know this would be uh, what you would advise. Thanks, Kemi. Uh, Richie, were you going to say something? I just, it, I would reiterate what both um, my colleagues have said. I think we have an obligation if we have carry a researcher hat or badge to interpret others' research to the best of our ability, to be even-handed and to convey what the research means in terms that are understandable to policymakers. Um, and if, if that means, in fact, to having reviewed the research 
evidence base that you end up saying there is not much that we can say at the moment, it's all very preliminary, that still has value. Thank you. Uh, okay, um, we've got, thanks so much for this comment. Um, we, uh, I, I'm sort of uh, stuttering a little because um, the, the, the questions are jumping. Um, and I can see these two questions um, that I have uh, in front of me uh, are, the, are the two questions which um, have quite a lot of interest in. Let me just focus on the first one, okay? Um, in Singapore preschools, the focus is on holistic child development rather than focusing on a special, a specific domain like um, social emotional development. Um, so is self-control the only aspect that significantly contributes to better future life outcomes? Um, are there other key drivers? And I think this, this is mainly addressed to Richie. Uh, yes, Simon, I mean, as I mentioned in my short presentation, there are two generally accepted fundamental influences on life outcomes. Um, poverty or socioeconomic deprivation as being one of them, uh, and IQ or cognitive ability, generally speaking. Uh, both work via multiple pathways and probably have multiple underlying mechanisms that explains their pervasive impacts. So um, as Marinus said before, if you are dealing with a situation where the child is coming from a background um, that is um, characterized by poverty, the whole family is part of the, um, uh, the picture here um, and the points of intervention would address their poverty circumstances beyond the, um, what goes on in the classroom. In terms of cognitive ability, um, there are a whole bunch of um, uh, cognitive, cognitive abilities um, uh, that may be um, contributing to a child's poor school progress and they need to be assessed properly. Um, there is, um, beyond social emotional skills or self-control, there's just a general um, um, uh, outwardness or preparedness to try new things um, that a child may be wary of and therefore avoid participating in simply because they're being maltreated. So maltreatment, neglect, um, independent of poverty, um, is another uh, very significant contributor to um, a person's emotional state and whether or not they achieve in the school setting and beyond in later life and employment settings. So please don't think that I'm suggesting self-control is a silver or magic bullet. Um, that said, if you had to pick one thing that hasn't been addressed well it's or systematically across the whole educational system, and I focus on education because that's the only universally endorsed and accepted in most cultures in government intervention. So it's not a vehicle for the delivering um, these skills. Um, if you had to pick one that's been underdone, um, it would be that. Um, and I believe it will have pervasive and meaningful impacts in a positive way. Certainly all we've heard about for the last 100 years um, in many jurisdictions is the importance of reading and writing. Well, just as, just as important is so social emotional skill. And that's why OECD and others talk about it as the 21st century skill. So it's not the be all and end all, but it's a bloody important one. Thanks so much. So much wisdom. Um, Marinus, you're, you're unmuted. Are we going to say something or add to this? Well, um, I think that it's, it's an absolutely critical um, competence, uh, absolutely critical competence. Uh, this self-control uh, it's one of the major foci of, uh, of one of our studies a twin study with interventions uh, connected to it but um, i think a little bit earlier in the life course uh, before birth and and in the first two years uh, i think there there is a, a very important construct to be taken into account which is of course uh, attachment uh, that is how uh, the, the child derives some kind of trust uh, fr from the parents or caregivers to explore the environment and to feel not stressed out when it's uh, separated uh, for a short or a longer period of time. Uh, we notice the critical importance of this in uh, our work on orphanages on uh, children without 
parents living in the first few years in an institutionalized environment without, in fact, any attachment figure to rely upon, they get a delay in all kinds of uh, developmental trajectories, especially in anthropometrics, uh, weight, height, uh, head circumference, very basic indicators of healthy development. And if they make the transition to family life, to foster families, adopt the families, there's a big jump to the better. And that's especially because I think the reinstatement of this, this attachment uh, relationship and, and, uh, and the need for attachment interactions being reinstalled in these children. So yes, I think critically important Maybe a little bit earlier in the life course, um, a special emphasis on attachment would be great as well. Not the only thing that's important again, but uh, a very important one. Attachment. Thanks so much for sharing with us the, the, the importance of, of, of attachment. Uh, so let me move on to the next question. Um, and I think this is something that I would like to spend some time um, uh, with, with the discussion. Um, it, be just because it's so important in Singapore. Um, so it reads, this question reads, it sounds like it takes many years to develop an intervention um, or making sure that the effects are replicable. Would it make more sense to adapt established interventions uh, versus creating an intervention from scratch? Um, so are there any recommendations on choosing interventions or the adaptation of interventions? So would anybody like to take this first? Ah, uh, yes, uh, Richie. Oh, me. Um, <laughs> yeah. Let me, let me, could, was someone else prepared to jump in? I'm just saying, <laughs> yeah, sure, it over. sure, sure. I, I, I will uh, jump in and yeah. uh, give you some time to uh, think it through <laughs> uh, because this is, this is a, a very important issue. Uh, that is um, uh, has been keeping us busy for quite some time. I think uh, absolutely uh, true that adaptation of certain core components of an intervention that uh, is successful to other settings, to other populations is very important. That's exactly what we did in the video feedback intervention. It's based upon providing parents in the first round with videotaped interactions and having parents reflect upon what's happening, exactly how it comes through in the infant, in the, uh, in the child. And, and, and that's in itself a learning experience that really makes an impact. Now, if you take that component and transport it to other settings, for example, the school setting or the setting of a caregivers in an early childhood education setting, I think uh, that's a, a wonderful opportunity because I would think that the core working ingredient is still working, uh, but you have to adapt it to uh, different settings. But you can make use of all the experiences that are collected throughout the development and, and uh, the testing of the original program. And that's exactly, I think, what went on the last uh, three decades with, with our video feedback intervention. Hmm. Thanks so much. Um, uh, so can I add to that by, yeah, by sure. saying that um, once you've, gotten, you've chosen your intervention and you're implementing it with high fidelity, in other words, you're doing it correctly and you're doing QA, quality assurance, monitoring your outcomes. Now that's not solely to prove to the government agency that you're making a difference. It should be seen as a necessary part of the R&D pipeline, research and development. Um, my experience in New Zealand is we okay at the research, but we don't think as much as we should about the development side of things. And by that, I mean continuous improvement. So the data you collect to ensure that your intervention that you've adapted or um, or develop from scratch, but most often you can add to existing proven interventions to suit your needs to make sure that it's actually getting better. Because right now, if you did the gold standard in the best possible way, you might achieve medium-sized effects. In other words, not all will benefit. 
And so the constant challenge will be, how do we make that even more potent? How do we drive our effect size up from small to medium up to large? In other words, with more benefit accrued across more members of the group of interest. So it's a continuous, hopefully virtuous cycle of building and building and learning and building and learning and building um, that I think needs to be something that researchers um, buy into in partnership with policymakers, because I think they tend to have a very black and white view. Is that any good for this challenge? Yes, we'll throw, it, we'll throw the money at, at that intervention and we'll walk away and it all be, our job is done now. It's not true at all. Thanks so much um, for this very valuable piece of advice, um, both for researchers as well as policymakers. Uh, I'm, I'm looking at the list of questions uh, with a, a touch of dismay because um, I think we have at least 12 more questions um, down there, uh, but um, we have, uh, we are, we're practically out of time. So um, I'm just going to exercise um, the prerogative I have as the panel chair over a uh, moderator over here and, and perhaps I'm um, just to encourage um, those of you who are attending this, this panel to, to uh, bear with us. Um, I, and to keep an eye on the, the different talks that we have uh, so that we will have different opportunities to be learning from the very many experts that um, we at the Center for Research and Child Development will be bringing in. But um, uh, as I was preparing for this talk, one of the things that I, uh, for this um, uh, webinar, one of the things I did was to look at the list of people who have registered. And I think uh, we have over 200 people who have registered internationally uh, for this webinar today. So, um, and, and in the list, as I was looking at, we have uh, in our midst researchers, um, teachers, uh, content specialists, school leaders, policy makers. Um, I want to bring, uh, I, want, I would like to ask the panel to, to uh, if you have any take home message for um, those who are present uh, with us today, uh, what would be one message that you would like um, those who are listening in to, to take home. I started with Richie. I was wondering whether I can go in the opposite or in the reverse order and perhaps start with Mariners um, and then with Kami and then I'll, um, I'll ask Richie again. Um, my take home message would be to those in the audience that are decision makers in terms of um, financing uh, certain research programs. And it's not meant to be a support for any specific party or center or whatever, but I think what we need is really more sustained research programs in the longer term. Short term financing research programs is wasting a lot of time, energy and talents. And I think we should go for longitudinal studies like the Dunedin study, a beautiful project and, and for intervention experiments because those two combined really are going to make a difference in practice and, and policy. But there is a need for stability of teams for in the long run. And now there's this really big problem in the United States and Holland as well postdocs uh, going from temporary job to temporary job from team to team because the, the money is soft and, 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 and there's not security in the long run. I think that's so detrimental, such a waste of talent. So my call is to the policy makers, decision makers to go for long-term investments here. Thank you, Marina. Such an important point you have raised. Um, Kimi. Thanks for the question. I will preface it by saying I was I wrote this book on dyslexia, dysgraphia and ADHD from a cross cultural perspective. And I was really interested in integrating research for that, but also in um, in uh, interviewing individuals who have dyslexia or dysgraphia, who's, who are parents, who are educators, who are teachers, because I think that there's always a back and forth between the two groups. And I, I saw again and again, any individual I would ask, like what, what, what helps you if you have dyslexia? Every individual has different preferences. Maybe you think 
bigger print will help you, or maybe you think avoiding sugar will help you, all those things. And at an individual level, I think we can all relate to that. Like if I have a headache, maybe I do something different than what you do if you have a headache. At the same time, there are big research projects that demonstrate trends in a group of people. And so I think we have to um, really respect the research. We understand that there are, a lot, there are a lot of things that can help individuals. And if it helps somebody feel better or to read better on, on an individual level or to be motivated, that's fantastic. But we have to um, hopefully really respect the research. So um, I'm, I'm appreciative of what Marinus said. I agree with that. But I think if we're talking from different perspectives, teachers, principals, parents, there's always this contrast. So I would always value a research study over individual opinions, despite the fact that I understand that both are important for every individual's life. Thanks. Thanks, Kemi. Richie? Um, so I've got two um, pieces of advice. What The first one is more for researcher um, colleagues in the audience. And it's something I always ask myself about what I'm doing research-wise. And it's a pretty simple question. Is it, is this geared towards helping real people living real lives? And I, I, it's almost corny the way I put it. But what I'm trying to emphasize there, and this is the second part of my advice to people that are practitioners, is that context matters. And Cammy was alluding to this, I think. Um, Marinus makes a good point about continuity of support. So work can continue and begin to, to build something that's pretty special and make a difference over the long term. But when you're talking from an educational setting point of view, never forget that the child is there for one part of their life and remaining blank or agnostic about what happens at home is not advisable. You have to understand the context the child is bringing in their mind and their heart, if you will, to the school setting. And if it is all possible, institutions, educational institutions should be given legitimate roles to make that link to parents. Uh, I don't, different cultures vary in terms of how much they emphasize that link, but I think that needs to be strengthened. Um, Everyone will benefit in that way. A little bit more work, but everyone will benefit. And of course, the most important people will benefit the most, which is the children in our care. Thank you so much, Richie, Kemi, and Marinus. I was going to give a summary, but um, when after hearing the the, the bits of the, the, the sharings of with so much wisdom, I, I, I can't say anything else. I can't add anything else. So I think uh, it leaves me only to, on behalf of everyone here, because we can't see the, 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 the audience uh, to just all to hear the clips, but to really to thank you all for uh, sharing your time, sharing your wisdom, and um, really sharing your expertise with us. Uh, we really, really appreciate that. So thank you so much. Uh, we are, this is not the end. Um, and um, you will hear from us over and over again. Well, for those of you who are in the audience, we will be keeping you abreast of um, the many events. Um, Unseng, you're going to say something after this? Yeah. So just to say thank you very, very much to all our very distinguished uh, speakers again and for the moderation by uh, Prof. Kenneth. The, you know, we just heard, you know, from about a century of uh, wisdom, you know. Uh, not to exaggerate that our speaker's age, but uh, this, if there is any uh, facial device that Richie Potter that used, they certainly look much younger. Uh, but, but really, you know, so much wisdom that we uh, uh, gathered uh, that I think is so uh, useful for every one of us. Uh, and, and we are really excited. And I think uh, uh, maybe I will just uh, close by thanking again all the participants. Uh, we thank you so much for your questions, for your interest. Uh, 
And as Kenneth said, we certainly hope to look for more opportunities where we can uh, interact and, and learn more about this area. So uh, I think uh, if I were to summarize in one uh, word, uh, is that uh, we all just need to be more mad, uh, M-A-D, uh, about early childhood research. Uh, uh, M-A-D stands for first, we really need all this wonder of this multiple, multiple perspectives, you know. Uh, I think we need so much wisdom through the different perspective. Uh, A stands for aletheia, the Greek word for truth or reality or authenticity. And I think we need to authenticate our research through such wisdom that we gathered about longitudinal research, about replicability, and also about the reality of contextualizing research with our partners, you know, uh, who, who are the key players. And finally, D, which is we need to have more uh, dialogue like this. And we certainly look forward to uh, future sessions of dialogue uh, with all of you. So thank you very much and have a good uh, evening. Thank you. Goodbye. <laughs> thank you. Thank we you. Have, yeah, thank you. We have come to the end of our webinar. So thank you, panelists and uh, Associate Prof. Kenneth Poon for the very engaging and stimulating uh, discussion. And also to uh, Centre Director Prof. Tan for the closing address. So we would also like to thank everyone in the audience for being here today. Before you leave, do scan the QR code on the screen, which is a QR code to a feedback form. We would appreciate it if you could leave us any feedback or comments you have regarding the webinar. So thank you again for joining us today and we will see you next time. Goodbye.